So the common way that refactoring is often taught to people is in the cycle of test-driven development and the red-green refactor cycle that you've probably heard of. So in this approach, what we do is we begin by saying we need to add some new feature to the program. We begin by writing a test, um, a test for what the feature will do when it's been completed. Then, of course, we run our tests and this new test will fail. I always think it's very important to watch every test fail at least once. Then we make the test work, and we do that in as a rough uh, and direct a manner as possible, not caring too much about the way the shape of the program looks like, but focusing on just get that damn test working. Then once you're green, and this is the very important step that is often missed by people who are new to test-driven development, you then refactor so that you can make the code right and clean and effective. And it's often something that people get a little bit confused as to why do we do this two-step thing? You make it work and then you separately make it clean. One way of thinking about this that goes right back to the early days of talking about refactoring is the metaphor of the two hats. The idea is that when you're programming, you're in two distinct modes, either adding new functionality to the program or refactoring. And you can only really be doing one of them at a the time. You should concentrate on doing one or the other. So you can only wear that one hat at a time, but you swap frequently between them. And the point of this is that when you're refactoring, you're in a different mode of work. Your tests are working, but they should always be working. Every tiny change you make, everything's still working. And the better great key to refactoring effectively is to take very small steps. Every step you take, everything is still green. And by taking lots of small steps, you can actually move very, very quickly because the small steps compose very well. And so as a result, when I'm refactoring, I've, it's a much calmer process than when I'm trying to get something to work. The hard hat is always a bit more uncomfortable to wear. But when I'm refactoring, I can move much more quickly. So that's why in the red-green refactor process, you say, well, those first two steps of writing the test and making it work, they're hard hat. They're diff more difficult to do, they're more stressful, you're not quite sure what's working or not. When you're refactoring, on the other hand, it's much more straightforward. You know the various moves you can make, you can see where you're going. If you make a mistake, you just step back and try something different or try the thing again. You're much li less likely to make mistakes and mess things up. And that focus on that step is really what's important here. So I think this of refactoring in the context of test-driven development. And it's, as I said, it's where most people are taught about it, but it's not the only way in which you can use refactoring or that you should use refactoring. So how many times have you looked at some code and said, oh, that's not right? Ew. Somebody else's code, perhaps? Probably your own code, to be honest. Um, and you see that there's an there's a obvious problem there. Well, if you're wanting to keep your software healthy, it's important that you fix programs, problems as soon as you see them. So there's a rule there for refactoring that says, when you see something that's not right, that doesn't look OK, refactor to fix it. I think of this as like picking up the litter or the trash at the campsite. You should always follow the camping rule of leave the campsite cleaner than when you found it. So when you see problems, you should be quick to fix them right away. And of course, the great thing about refactoring, since by the whole point of refactoring is that you don't break anything when you're refactoring, then you should be free to do that. And I want to stress this, don't break anything. I do hear sometimes people say, oh, I'm in the middle of refactoring, so everything's broken. When they say that, I know they're not refactoring. <laughs> because the whole definition of refactoring is that you're making changes that don't change the overall behavior of the program. So if it works before you do a refactoring, if it's a correctly done refactoring, it will still work afterwards. Lots of little changes. Now, very similar to this reaction with the litter pickup is, a, well, you can think of it as the same thing, but it's subtly different. It's when you're looking at a program and you don't quite understand how it works. You look at something and you say, oh, I'm having a think and puzzle out that code. 
And then after a while, you get the understanding. You say, oh, now I see what's happening. Ward Cunningham always said, uh, when you get that piece of understanding in your head, it's really important to move it out of your head and into the code. So that the next time you or somebody else comes to that piece of code, they don't have to go through that puzzling process. Looking at some text and trying to figure out what's going on and puzzling through it, that's a good thing in a detective novel. It's a bad <laughs> thing in code. I'll nick that one from Stephen Cole. Um, so always look to use the same idea. Use refactoring to shift that understanding, putting it back into the code. Now, there's a slight subtlety about this. You always have to ask yourself, do I want to fix it right away? And sometimes it's easier to just make the fix immediately. Sometimes you may want to wait a little bit. If you need to fix it right away, the first thing you need to do is to make sure that your tests are running correctly. Get into a green bar state. Um, sometimes you can do this perhaps by um, just making a simple change. Sometimes you're already on green. One thing I do that I very much encourage is I commit very, very frequently to my local repository. I mean, I will quite possibly commit all, pretty much every time the tests pass, even if I make very tiny little changes. So it doesn't matter. I can always squash all the commits together later before pushing to a, a shared resource. So um, in that situation, I might be, I can, might be able to stash um, or even do a, a commit and revert for a moment. You know, lots of possibilities there. But you need, to, whenever you're refactoring, to refactor on green tests. Then you can clean the problem and then get back to finishing the new feature. If it's very quick, it's often best to do it that way. But if it's a bit more complicated, then you might say, well, first finish off what I want to do, just make a note. Um, Kent Beck always likes to, pro always, you certainly used to always like to program with a little card next to his um, computer so that he could write a note of all the things he needed to do and he would do that afterwards. Whatever scheme works for you, keep a note of those little to-dos, and then immediately fix them once the feature has been finished. But again, you want to make sure you're in this um, thinking of this swapping the hats mode. You want to make sure that you do spend as much time as possible with the refactoring hat on. Now, perhaps one of the most important refactorings and, and, and often very effective ones is when you look at some code and say, well, the design of that code was OK, but now that I need to add this new feature, I realize that it would be much easier to add the new feature if we'd done it a different way. That doesn't necessarily mean we did a bad thing in the past because you, know, you can't predict the future with these things, and I always recommend you write for the features that you're currently building. But when you see that if, if it would have been easier if it had been done differently, then often the best move is to start the new feature by changing the existing code by doing what I call preparatory refactoring. So what you do here is you say, well, OK, the code should look like this, so let me use the refactoring to move it into that correct shape. Then I can then add that new feature. So whenever you're adding a new, uh, new feature, always ask yourself, is the code currently in the best shape to fit that feature? And if it isn't, use refactoring to get that good fit and then add that new feature. There's a, a nice uh, quote from, from Kent that I keep forgetting to put on the slides here that he made as a tweet where he said, if when you face with a change like this, the thing to do is to first make the change easy then make the easy change. Caveat being that making the change easy can sometimes be fairly hard. <laughs> but it, you're a refactoring in that situation. So you're in a much easier state to make changes through. Now another kind of refactoring is when you actually, as part of your planning process, you create refactoring tasks or refactoring stories as part of a uh, you know, here it might be some kind of card wall with some refactorings in place. Um, these are refactorings that are planned as part of an overall ongoing process. Now, I, I do need to stress here that a good team should hardly ever have to do planned refactoring. Because refactoring is something that you should be constantly doing. Every task that you're doing, it should be just part of the regular way you're working. 
the preparatory moves, the cleanups, the TDD, all of this is constantly working on improving the shape of the code base. So actually saying, I'm going to make a task and put it on the project plan, that should be something that you only very rarely do. A team that's learning how to do things is probably going to um, build up more refactoring that needs to be done and is more likely to need to do this. Um, but on the whole, you should try to avoid a planned refactoring. But that doesn't mean you should not attempt to do larger scale refactorings that take more than you can do in a single task or story. Um, a good example of this was um, a project I worked on many years ago where we had many modules with a rather complicated dependency structure between them. Things had really got out of hand. There was too much crosstalk between the different parts of the program. And the team knew they needed to fix that. <coughs> and so what they did, they spent uh, half an hour, an hour or so, discussing what the design really ought to look like, laying out what would be, what ought to be the right module structure. And then they said, okay, over the course of the next couple of months, let's gradually move from our current structure to the new one. Whenever you're in some part of the code and it isn't fitting what the new pattern ought to look like, try and move bits of it there. Don't do it all at once, but do little bits of it every day. And after a couple of months, they were fairly close to it, and the tech lead went in and, and finished the job by taking a, a day or two to just finish everything off. But the point there was they planned out a long-term refactoring, they gave everybody a sense of where they needed to go, and then they let it happen over time. They didn't stop the project to do the reorganizing of the modules. They were still delivering features as they went. And that, on the whole, is a, a structure I'm much more comfortable with for larger tasks like this, because it allows you to learn as you go. It avoids that stop the world refactoring thing, which is always a, a very bad sign. So I've talked a lot about how you can play refactoring into your workflow. But that still raises a question, and it's kind of hinted by the comment I made earlier on. A lot of people still are uncomfortable with doing refactoring. It's still this sense of it's sort of wasteful rework. Oh, you're refactoring. Well, you should have done it the right the first time then, shouldn't you? And I think it's important to understand why refactoring is important. And in fact, why it's useful, in, in, in any case, to have a well-structured program. Um, I use um, this little uh, metaphor as a way of thinking about it. It has a very ugly name, but it's a meaningful name, so I, I think it has something for that. And it said, let's just plot a graph of the cumulative function of, of a software against time. And most software kind of looks like this. Not much attention has been put into the design and architecture of the program. And as a result, as the program gets bigger, as time continues, it gets harder and harder to add new features. You feel yourself slowing down, more and more difficult to fix things. How many people have worked on a project that's like that? Pretty much everybody. But there is an alternative. If you put a good amount of attention to your design and architecture, you refactor regularly, you can actually get to a situation where you feel like you're speeding up. That adding a new feature, oh, I'll just use this, a little bit of that, you know, change this a little bit here, plug this in here, and I'm golden. And you have a feeling of going faster. The code base is an accelerator to, you, to what you're doing. How many people have worked on a code base like that? Hmm, a good number. Always less than the first number, but it's always good to see these hands go up. That is why we pay attention to these things. It allows us to continue to add new features more and more rapidly to avoid that slowdown and perhaps even to reverse it. And the point of this is that this is an argument that's based on our ability to write software rapidly, to be able to deliver features rapidly to our users and customers. And this is a really key point to remember when you're thinking about refactoring and why you do it and why you justify it. Well, I often come across teams that say, oh, well, the code's got in a bit of an ugly state, 
but we can't refactor it and, and we've, you know, we've argued that we should, that we're, we're creating bad code and we're, we're not being professionally responsible and our, we, we need to put more effort into our professionalism. And this is, I think of as the kind of the moral argument to refactoring. It's a, I'm a bad person if I don't refactor. I'm a bad team. I'm not professional enough. But as soon as you start trying to justify refactoring based on that, you've lost. Because, let's face it, users, customers, management, they don't give a toss about whether the code's clean. They just want plenty of features. So to justify refactoring, it's important to remember not to use that kind of professionalism, moralistic argument, but an economic argument. And an economic argument based on that pair of curves I showed you earlier on. By putting effort into refactoring, you're improving the design and architecture of a program, and therefore you're able to go faster, deliver more features more quickly. That's an economic reason to do it. So whenever in a situation where you are having to talk about refactoring, and most of the time I actually say, don't even talk about it. It should be just be part of your daily work. It's what we do. We don't talk about how much time we spend typing the letter E. Um, well, refactoring is like that. It should be part of our general flow. But when we do talk about it, it should always be in economic terms, because those are the things that matter. And as soon as you shift onto the professionalism, quality, clean code argument, you're going to lose. So focus on the economics. And that, I think, provides a good justification for that. Um, by the way, I don't provide slides in my talks. Um, this particular talk, the Workflows Refactoring talk, you can find, um, if you want to watch it again on a video, you can also find uh, an info deck that I've got on my website, the second reference there, that goes through the same discussion. So that's the first of the three talks. See, I get three times as much applause this way as well. Now, as you've probably guessed, I do a lot of my talks again and again. Um, rather than having to come up with talks all the time, I just do the same ones, like most speakers, actually. But hey, it works, because most people haven't seen them. And two of the three talks I'm going to do for you are, including that one I've just shown you, standard ones. But this is a Ruby conference. And I don't actually talk very much about particular programming languages in talks. Um, but for Ruby, there's actually a bit of an exception. People often say, well, you know, I'm a software writer, speaker, all the rest of it. Do I actually code anymore? And the answer, you know, like answers to any interesting question, is really it depends. Uh, depends what you mean by coding. I mean, most of the people that I talk to, most of my audience, people like you, you work on teams of people building features together um, for some kind of widely used commercial product or whatever, um, or maybe some internal system, but you're working on a team um, over the course of time. And I don't program as part of a team, but I do program fairly regularly. Um, I generate stack traces almost every week, um, which is a real test of you doing real programming, right? I mean, I did write some Ruby code yesterday, but I didn't generate a stack trace, so I clearly wasn't doing anything very difficult. What that code is, in fact, is the tool chain I use for the, my website, martinfowler.com. Um, it's a code base now that's been going for 15 years or so. Um, it's about just under 20,000 lines of code, so it's not a trivial program. It's only ever had me work on it, so that's why I don't kind of cloak out count it as real, full programming in the way that what you do, because it's a solo effort. And a solo effort is always kind of different. I don't have to worry about what my co-workers are doing. I don't have to adapt my coding style to the team norm, because I am the team. I decide what the norm is. Um, and as I said, as I implied, it's almost all Ruby. There's a bit of JavaScript in there. <coughs> um, there's a lot of CSS in there, actually. I looked, and it was kind of alarming how many lines of code of CSS are in there. 
um, but it is mostly Ruby. So I thought I'd, I'd make some thoughts and observations based on that, since this is a Ruby conference, and I'm with a bunch of Ruby programmers. So this was the first thing I did in Ruby on the website. Um, as you can see from the date, just about, um, 2003, so as I said, 15-year code base. Well, actually not quite, 13-year code base. A ah, bit of exaggeration. Um, this was, <coughs> I was interested, at the time, in the early 2000s, um, blogging was very fashionable. And I thought, hmm, that looks interesting. But what I didn't like about blogs was the fact that most of blog posts were very ephemeral. You know, something that you'd say something and then it would be forgotten. Writing for me is too hard work to do something that's only going to be around for a little bit. So I wanted something that would last a bit. So I had this idea of um, a kind of a cross between a blog and a wiki, where I would use defined, try to define terms, kind of perhaps like a philosophical dictionary, you know, echoes back of Voltaire or something. Um, what I talked to best to Ward Cunningham and he suggested the name Blicky. Um, and that's still a major part of my website. Now, <clears throat> my approach on the whole website, I have a general principle that I follow that is, and it's been true for me for a long time, to separate the content of what I'm talking about from its visual presentation. And I struggled a lot with that within the 90s. I mean, I would use tools that had good style sheets, for instance. Um, if you, people would use Word with or without styles, I always used them heavily. I actually didn't like Word very much. I used FrameMaker, heavily used styles to separate content and structure. And I always struggled in the 90s because I wanted to do something that would do a web page, but could do web page or print and still set, make that separation. And HTML was never quite up to it. Um, but then I used a, started to use XML, and that's still the case. I know XML is terribly old-fashioned these days, and none of you would be caught dead using it in public. Um, but actually, as a markup language, XML is remarkably good. Anyone would think it was designed for such a purpose. <laughs> so all my posts are written in XML. It's my own dialect of XML, which is mostly HTML, but with uh, the core elements of HTML, but with things added, tweaks here and there. And then I run it through a processing step to turn it into the HTML. And the processing step originally was XSLT. Um, if you looked at my website in sort of pre-2003, it was all generated in XSLT. And, you know, I like XSLT. It's nice to have programmed in a language worse than JavaScript. <laughs> I don't know that I'll ever program in a language as bad as XSLT again. I mean, that is truly appalling. But I did it for a while, and I thought, this is really ridiculous. And I had this idea of creating this blicky, and I had to go to India um, for some work stuff. And it was a long flight, and I needed something to do. So I programmed the first version of the blicky on the flight to India in Ruby, and found that working in Ruby was way, way easier than working in XSLT. And from that moment on, I decided all my future work on my website is going to be in Ruby. To give you a sense of, of what the site does now, that's some of my traffic information. You know, I'm not competing with Stack Overflow or anything like that, but it's a fair amount of traffic. Um, the thing that I find most interesting is, um, is actually this statistic here, which is how many pages have I got that get more than 1,000 views in a month, particularly pages, and this is not reflected in this stat because I haven't done the analytics enough to do it, uh, particularly pages that are at least six months old. Because to me, I feel I've done something valuable if I've written something that's gone past the initial uh, attention span, but is still being read a lot. I think if that's the case, then it's probably useful to people. And that's what I'm trying to do, is be useful. So that's actually the thing I most focus at. So my site is, um, you know, it's not huge. It does get sometimes hit by Hacker News or in the old days Slashdot for people who remember that. Um, but it never falters 
Because one of the first decisions I made, and one of the best decisions I made, back in 2003, was to not do anything other than a simple static site. And that may sound kind of strange now, because it's become more common with tools like Jekyll and the like to do static sites. But back in the early 2000s, it wasn't. I mean, the idea was, well, even if you're doing a simple blog, you should use a database. What was the original Rails example? It was a, data, it was a blog, right? Um, and the idea was then, oh, of course you'd be installing some software and running it on your server. Um, and pretty much nobody I talked to would consider con just throwing a bunch of HTML files on and letting it do it. Um, but of course, the static site has huge benefits. Um, it makes the code base much simpler because I have a one-way transformation. And I like one-way transformations. Updates are painful. But if you don't have to update anything, or you control the pattern of updates, then it really makes things a lot more straightforward. In fact, this is a general principle that goes more wider than a simple website. Um, I refer to, I've got a blicky post somewhere, you'll hear it, you, you can find it, called the Editing Publishing Separation. And it basically says that you should have completely different software stacks for editing content as opposed to publishing content. And the reason is, when you're editing content, you have very few people, and they're making lots of changes and updates to your content. But when you're publishing, you have, you hope, lots and lots of people who are only ever reading. And any updates are only done through a very simple and, and relatively infrequent channel. So it makes very little sense to use the same software stack for two completely different performance profiles. And we've done this at scale. Uh, one of the teams at Fortworks did a website for one of the major electronics companies, their customer um, catalog stuff, and they followed that principle, where they had completely separated the software from the publishing side and the editing side. When somebody was done editing, it would go through onto the publishing side, and then completely different software would handle it. Now, they didn't do static sites. It wasn't as simple as what I do, but the same principle followed which is, I think, a sign of how certain principles and patterns really do work at different scales. And they're often, sadly, forgotten. Um, I've come across several teams who really regretted not making that step of that separation right from the very beginning, um, simply because then you're thrown into a situation where you have, as I said, two different performance characteristics to deal with. You can't easily cope with both of them. And, of course, make everything static as much as you like, because then um, it caches really easily, which is why Slashdot has never brought my site down. I've brought down some of my colleagues by referring to them. I always like that. It hasn't happened for a while, but I knocked out Jez Humble's continuous delivery site the first time I mentioned it. I was really proud of that one, because Jez is an ops guy. So, um, <coughs> I mentioned uh, the stats. Um, that 14 um, KLOX of Ruby is the basic library files. There's actually some more Ruby that I'll mention later on. Um, as you see, about 1,200 XML source files. They don't correspond one-to-one -to, -one to the actual URLs for all sorts of reasons, but that's roughly what I've got there. Nearly 500 items in the Blicky now, after all these years, and 300 other articles, apparently. Well, that's pages under the articles thing, so that may not be exactly there. But as I said, the basic approach here is a one-way transformation step. Turn some XML into HTML using Ruby. And um, the basic structure of the system is, is relatively straightforward. Uh, when I put my hand up to say I can build things faster and faster because of the existing code, that is the tool chain for me. Um, it, it, it feels a bit odd to say this, because I always encourage people to look at your old code and, and wince, because that way it shows you learning. And I don't look at my own old code in this toolchain and wince, which worryingly says I've perhaps you know, got old and have passed it, which is quite possibly true. Um, but I'm actually quite pleased of how things have turned out. At the heart of what we do um, when I'm transforming HTML to X, um, XML to HTML, is I have a simple transformer program. And the, the program is actually very straightforward and is somewhat um, inspired, I think, by the way that XSLT worked. 
Because the, the language is terrible, but the, the actual processing model makes sense. So at the heart of this is, now I read the XML into a tree with Nokogiri. Thank you, Nokogiri. I mean, that's um, sped up my website considerably when I switched over from XML to Nokogiri. Um, and I basically have a, 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 the heart of the whole thing is a very simple recursive process that just starts at the top and says, OK, what kind of node do I have in my tree? And most of it case, things are kind of boring. But the most interesting one is when that node is an element. Then I have this um, handle element um, program that does this. And the core thing, notice what I do is the core thing that I do, is I basically say, have I got a method defined in my class that matches the name of the element? with a little bit of transposition for hyphens, because Ruby doesn't allow hyphens in its names. If I've got one of those, then I'm going to call it. So this is, a, this is the kind of thing that would be, is, is um, I'm always a bit wary of doing, to be quite honest, in most code, because you know, dynamically creating the method names that you're going to call. But it actually works really nicely um, for this case, because then if I want to handle new elements, all I've got to do is write the appropriate piece of code. It's very explicit. And it will get um, called as part of the processing of the tree. And um, something else to notice in here is that um, I have a, a similar to a builder. Um, so if you've used the builder library in XML or the builder on Nakugiri, it's a similar kind of approach where I have methods that correspond to the things I'm about to build. I don't actually use the builder in Nakugiri or uh, the XML builder class because this stuff was written before that was around. Um, and that's actually quite useful. Um, one of the problems with a lot of things that generate XML and indeed other um, libraries is that they rely on a, fail, on a, the way they serialize the XML is based on, I've got a dictionary of attributes, and I'll just serialize that off. Because XML attributes, it doesn't matter what order they appear in the XML, right? It, it, it's the same. And same with JSON, right? If I've got a bunch of keys, it doesn't matter what actual order they get serialized into the JSON text. However, even though that's true in theory, in practice, it's actually quite useful to be able to determine the order of them. And in my case, it's for testing purposes. A little bit of a confession. Of that code in the, for my, runs my website, there aren't very many unit tests, which is weird, because I'm a unit testing guy. But the reason there aren't many tests is I have an extremely fast and effective functional end-to-end um, -end test suite, which is I build the entire website which takes, ooh, about a minute and a half. And then I just diff the entire website with uh, a, a known good copy. It's a very effective test suite. Very particular to my circumstances, and I wouldn't recommend it for everybody, but it works for me. However, it doesn't work if your outputting mechanism is randomly switching around XML attributes, because then you get a huge amount of false failures. So one of the nice things about having my own builder is that I can force it to go out in alphabetical order, and therefore I've got a deterministic output. And it's time and time again I kind of want to kick people and say, if you're going to serialize, particularly into a text format, please at least give me a switch to allow it to be deterministic, as opposed to just a random output order. Because often text diffing is a useful way of figuring out what the hell's going on. Now, with Nakugiri, with the later versions, you can actually get a, a canonicalized XML that will actually do that. Um, but there are plenty of tools out there that generate JSON or generate XML that will not give you a deterministic output. And I find that incredibly annoying. So, so as well as a transformer, I need a whole host of other things that tie up to it. And so... When I'm transforming a piece of, of an article, I'll say, OK, I need to know the input and output files, obviously. Um, but there's also a bunch of other things that I might need to know. I typically have bibliographic references. And I like to use, um, similar to how you do in Markdown, rather than actually putting the URL directly into the reference, I like to keep a separate set of references in a bibliography. 
So I have a little bibliography server routine that actually does that. Most important is the code part of the thing. Um, I don't cut and paste code directly into my documents. I learned a long time ago that that's a very painful thing to do because whenever you need to edit the code, then are you going to go through a retest and recopy and paste, or are you going to kind of take the shortcut? And, and it's very easy to get out of sync. But now I have a system by which I just put comment markers in actual live code, and I put um, tags in my XML that say, go to this file, grab this piece of code, and then insert it into the output. And that means I basically never have to worry about my code being out of sync or not being tested, because I can always run the tests on the output code. Um, I've been doing that for a long time. It, it saved a lot of trouble for me. And I, when I'm doing this, the transformer needs something that actually coordinates and keeps this stuff together. And so it's a thing I call a maker. Not a terribly good name, but hey, I was out of names that day. And it's interesting because I actually got irritated for a while with this class. Because um, it's kind of a manager, right? It doesn't really do anything. And, and we were always taught you should never have manager-like objects in your code, right? Um, and so I thought to myself, I don't like this. I'm going to get rid of it. And I, over a, a course of maybe a year or so of gradual refactoring, I tried to get rid of the damn thing. And then I realized it actually was very useful. Um, and then I stopped trying to get rid of it. Um, and the key really is knowing object managers are not a bad thing as long as all that they're doing is coordinating action. So basically what the maker does is I tell it the input and output file. It can find these other things. Where's the code sources? Where's my bibliographic source? All that kind of information. And then when the transformer wants a particular lookup from the uh, bibliogra bibliography, it can say, oh, here's the server for the bibliography information for you. And it's really doing nothing more than tying things together. And as long as it only does that and doesn't actually try to do any real work, then you're OK. So that's my takeaway from that. Don't be afraid of manager objects as long as you keep them minimal and they don't do any real work. Like true managers, right? You never want a manager doing any real work. You want them to be coordinating and talking to other people, right? Um, do that with your objects as well, and it seems to work really well. And I've come to peace with my makers, and in fact, my makers have gotten now more capable over time as, the, as I've begun to realize they are a coordination mechanism so that I can use them for some um, things that, that pull from that. It's also nice because it provides a very pluggable system. Um, if I need some new feature, um, I can easily create some new element. I just tell the maker about it, and the maker creates a context. And that's another thing that I think is very useful to think of these things. A lot of programming is about creating contexts. And so the part of a, of a manager-like object or a maker-like object is to create the context for something else to work, which is, again, like real-world managers. They try to create this context by keeping away distractions and deciding what things can, acting a bit as a filter. Often good managers provide air cover for their teams. Similarly, um, objects can do that by providing the appropriate context. You'll also notice Another thing I've heard people say about objects is that you should always beware of objects that end in ER, like transformer, or manager, or maker, or server. Because those objects are really functions, and, and of course, we should have objects. Um, this, working on this code base, has reinforced my view that that is baloney. Uh, there is nothing wrong with objects that look like functions if the functionality is sufficiently complicated. And these are, if you're always working in a functional programming language, these will quite naturally fit as functions. Certainly the transformer is a classic function in a functional programming language. All I ever do with a transformer effectively is create it and say, run. And in fact, that's very common in my code base is I have a lot of objects that basically only have one method. Only one public method, I should say. As long as what they're doing is more complex, it uh, gives me a way of breaking up that complexity in the same way that in a functional programming you create a nested set of functions for something. And that's a perfectly good way to operate. There are other objects that will manage more complex pieces of data, and that's fine too. 
Um, but don't be afraid of objects that just do something. Um, my observation always that uh, to an object bigot, a function is just an object with only one method. And to a function bigot, an object is just a bunch of functions closing over some um, closure of state. The two are both useful ways of looking at the world, and it's often useful to combine them together. The nice thing about Ruby is it allows you to easily combine the two very effectively, um, which is one of the things I like about it. Um, a lot of people learned object orientation in Java, and Java has some real problems for that. Um, I learned my objects in Smalltalk, so that's why I'm more comfortable with Ruby. Um, I don't want to say too much more on this. Um, oh, well, the one last thing I wanted to mention was something about, something about the size of things. Um, that was looking at the library code base. Um, one of the things I was interested in doing recently was looking at how big my methods are. And that's a cumulative count of the size. And as you see, a huge amount of my methods are really very small, which doesn't surprise me, because um, I know my habits enough. But I was actually surprised to find that out of nearly 2,000 methods, almost half are only one line, which is kind of nice. And, and half of them are just two line, two or one, one or two lines. Um, I don't know whether that reflects, whether that's good or bad. It works for me. Um, and I just thought I'd share it. Um, this is the, the classes that I've got. Um, as you see, most of them are under 20 methods and under, under 100 lines of code. So lots of small classes. But a few outliers. I have that monster there that's 400 lines of code. <sighs> that is actually the transformer for articles. So it has all of the handle methods for every single element that I have in an article. It's actually very easy to navigate around. Um, so I, very rare, I pretty much never get lost in it. Um, and the others are, kind of, as I said, there's four really kind of no outliers there. I haven't really thought much about doing anything about that. 400 lines of code doesn't seem terrible to me. Um, but in, by the context of my code base, it clearly is very unusual. And the last thing I wanted to mention, um, we're off to, a lot of people, you hear people sneering about inheritance. Um, I'm sure you've all heard. Well, favor composition over inheritance, people say. As if inheritance is a kind of bad thing. Now, if you overuse inheritance, you can get yourself into trouble. But that's true of just about anything. Um, the difference between a, a useful drug and a poison is dosage. You always have to think about what's the appropriate dosage for inheritance. Um, I found inheritance to be very interestingly useful in my code base. Um, I talked about this notion of a transformer. I have a very abstract transformer that basically does that tree walking thing and is quite a small class. And the bulk of the work for a, uh, transforming an article is a subclass of that that adds all those handle methods for all the elements that I have in my um, typical articles. And that's that 400 article monster. And um, there are other transformers that I have. And it's very useful to use inheritance to think of that. Inheritance actually is quite a nice way. The, the trouble is, I think, we're often taught about inheritance in terms of type hierarchies. You know, you have people, you have animal, people, manager, something like that, and programmer. And we think of it in terms of type hierarchy. How many people were taught inheritance that way? Pretty much everybody I come across was. I used to do it when I taught. But actually, most of my inheritance is nothing to do with that. It's about, oh, I have this piece of code that does most of what I'd like, but if I could just tweak it a little bit, it would be exactly what I needed. And actually, that's most of the inheritance I do. Um, or I've got this code that's not quite like that over there, but it's got some similarities, and I refactor up the similarities and then pull down off that. It's much more ad hoc, and there isn't really any thinking of a type hierarchy in place. And in fact, I've got a lot of code that is very customized transformers for one particular article. And that's because when I'm, because I'm a believer in very much in semantics for my markup, if I've got something you see, if you see in an, uh, in an article of mine a table, it's almost certainly not represented as a table in the core XML. It'll be represented as an actual 
semantic meaning and then transformed to a table as part of the transform process. And I actually have quite a lot of code that's only written for transform one particular article. Um, and so quite a lot of articles I've got. And having that ability to, for one particular case to tweak and add a little bit of extra processing is really, really useful. And that's where I use a lot of inheritance. And those classes aren't even counted amongst the class counts I showed you earlier on, because they're actually part of the document tree rather than the code tree part of the site. Anyway, that's just a, a bunch of kind of random thoughts. I haven't given that talk before, and I probably never will again. So I hope you enjoyed it. Now, usually when I give a talk, I like to give it a title that tells you what the talk's going to be about. This talk is different. I don't like to tell you really what it's about. So, I'm just going to lead us through it. And I begin with my biggest frustration with what's happened to agile software development. Lots of people have problems. You've probably seen Prag Dave, you, well, you should go and see Prag Dave's kind of Agile is Dead talk is quite a good indication of his. My frustration is somewhat more particular, my biggest one. In the bad old days, people would say the right way to build software is to build this big complicated requirements document and then a programming team will turn that into working code. One thing that's good about the Agile world is that it's got rid of that big pile of documents and says let's break everything down into small chunks of work, typically called stories, and one at a time, we'll turn them into software and reflect on what we do and learn and adapt, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem, oh, and then this has benefits, clearly. But there is a problem. And the problem is that notion of an arrow. That somehow the product owner comes up with these stories and hands them to the software developers and they code them up. And that's totally against what I see and what most of my fellow manifesto authors saw as what Agile software was about. When we, talked to, when we talked about names for Agile software development, one of the names that was suggested, Kent suggested it if I remember correctly, was it should be conversational software development. Because the whole point was to have conversations between developers and users, customers, whatever, we didn't have the term product owners then, about what should go in stories and how they should look and what they should be. There's no reason why programmers can't come up with stories. I think there is still value in having some role like a product owner role that prioritizes. Um, in many cases, I think that's useful. Not always, but often. But the point is it should be a much more collaborative effort. Because the idea of how do we come up with useful software is not just something that's in the head of users, customers, and product owners, and analysts, but also in us as software people. We're used to software. We work with it a lot. We often can see things and come up with ideas that other people can't. And we should contribute to that. And so my big frustration with Agile software is that it's lost, for so many teams, it's lost that conversational quality, where developers should be participating actively in deciding what to build. Now, in order to change that, in order to, to allow developers to contribute, it's important to have knowledge about the domain that you're working in. And this is a, a similar, related frustration I have, is uh, too many developers that I run into do not spend enough time finding out about the domain that they're working in. Um, I was talking to a, a team of, of ours, to, to a lead of a team, of ours that was doing some really interesting work around genetics. They were doing this project where they were doing um, genetic analysis, and it was really interesting. And uh, the team lead, though, was very frustrated because he said nobody on the team was interested in genetics. He got hold of books on genetics. He'd really tried to get some understanding of the subject. And he thought everybody else on the team would be as well, and they weren't interested. They said, oh, just tell us what to code. If you want to really see the point of what Agile software development, you have to get engaged and you have to understand the domain. So think to yourself, how much time are you spending understanding the domain that you're working in? And often that understanding is more valuable than how to do some really clever trick in Ruby or JavaScript or whatever. 
because that domain knowledge will lead to much more powerful changes than um, a lot of the programming oriented ones. So when many programmers ask me for career advice, I often say, get, to, get good at understanding a domain. Even if you move out of that domain into another domain, it's amazing how many things can carry over. And the most important thing, of course, is the ability to learn, and to be able to pick up new domains and learn about them and ask questions and get engaged in that. Now, this is not just about knowledge. It's also about something broader, which is a responsibility for the stories that you're working on. So not just should we be knowledgeable about what we're building and knowledge about our domain, we should also think that what actually we're building is important and it makes a difference to people. And we are somewhat responsible for that. How many people have come across the concept of dark patterns? Anybody come across it? A few of you? So dark patterns are things that people do with websites in order to encourage people to do things that are not in their self-interest. So the simplest thing might be, you know, you're on a commerce website and people are buying electronics. And, you know, one of your features is that when somebody buys a piece of electronic equipment, you add an item to the shopping cart for extra insurance. That's a dark pattern, right? The user didn't ask for that. It was kind of just chucked in the shopping cart and you kind of hope they don't notice. Or I've been told, um, and I haven't verified this, so it may be an urban legend, but I don't think it is, that printers often will tell you that their cartridges are running out of ink when there's plenty of ink in there. That's a dark pattern. Now I think as software developers, we have to kind of recognize this. And we have to say, we need to be advocates for our users. We are responsible for the code we write. If we write code that says we're running out of ink when there's 30% you know, of ink left in there, we are just as responsible for the badness of that as the person who told us to write that code. Because let's face it, it's not going to get written unless somebody actually types it in. And we have to take responsibility for that. Because in many ways, both what I said before with taking a, a role in, in deciding what stories to build, it, it's about us taking a bigger role in the work that we do. I mean, we are, we like to think of ourselves as a profession. You know, we're a well-paid, um, we're intelligent people, um, contributing, we hope, to, the, to uh, a better world. We have to take responsibility for that. And one of those responsibilities is to be an advocate for our users and to think about what goes on with that. And it goes more broadly than this. In thinking of how we, what software development, you can, one model of it is to say there's some users out there with needs and somebody, whether under the name analyst or not, turns those needs into stories, little pieces of intention of what the software needs to do, and then somebody programs and turns that into code. And we go around and around this loop. But an important part of this is that the, what the user is doing has an impact upon the world. And if for us, as programmers, we need to think about that. We need to say, what kind of impact? are our users having on the world? What kind of impact is our software having on the world? Is our software making the world a better place? Now, this can easily be misinterpreted. Um, I remember I gave a talk similar to this once and somebody came afterwards and they said, well, I don't really you know, do any um, uh, software, as you say, that is, that is important to benefit. I just write printer drivers, ironically. Um, and then the person behind him tuned in right before I could even react and said, yeah, but coming up with printer drivers, that is actually very useful. I've just bought a house. I had to print out huge amounts of mortgage information and I could just print it because I had a printer. We don't have to be feet, um, saving starving children in order to be having a beneficial impact on the world. Now, I was coming here from Lisbon. I found it really helpful to be able to look on the train timetables on the Portuguese railway site. That's useful. That made my life better. 
But it is important, I think, for us to always think about that. I mean, is what we're doing making our users' lives better? Uh, my frustration a lot is with my generation, whole generation of people, is how many really bright, clever people decided to spend their lives going into the financial world and providing tools to make rich people gamble with each other to make themselves richer. That's such a waste of talent and capability. I mean, I dabbled in that world for a little bit, enough to knew I didn't want to do that, but the waste um, appalls me. But that is my opinion, and that actually isn't the point. It's not for me to say whether the software you're working on is beneficial or not to the world. That's actually not important. What is important is it is your responsibility to, to think about that and to decide whether the software you work on is, is better making the world better or not. And you are responsible for the outcome of that decision. I mean, we're in a fortunate position. Um, software developers are in great demand in the world, and I suspect will be for a long time to come. We have a relatively good choice as to where we might go and to who we give our talents. And we are responsible for that decision. I'm not going to say to someone, well, I'm not often going to say to someone, I think you're doing a bad thing with what you do with your work. But I am always going to say, you are responsible for the outcome of what your software does to the world. And you have to think about that and take, and take that responsibility. Then, as kind of a last step in this discussion, it's worth thinking about our entire profession's impact upon the world, as programmers, as the software we write, and the broad picture there. And there are two areas in particular where I think we need to put a lot of attention. And two areas that I certainly do a try to do a little about. The one is, you look at any software conference, this is actually, I think, a bit better than many, but still not great. And you'll notice we don't really reflect the universe that we look at. There are some noticeable changes, differences between the population of the world at large and the population of people in a software conference. And that indicates a problem. One of the things that many of us have worried about is the alienating atmosphere that gets generated in many software communities that pushes away people, particularly women, particularly people from historically disadvantaged groups. In America, you find it, you know, race is a factor. Um, every country and culture has different things, although uh, lack of women is true pretty much universally. We, as a profession overall, have to think about that and consider about that. And there are people that really make an effort to try and do something about it, and I'm glad that the, the organizers of this conference seem to be of the view that we should try to do something about that. Um, and I think it's important upon all of us to do it, not just for our own profession, but also in terms of the software systems that we have. Um, a lot of um, alienation is being caused by software systems. Um, and you know, an example of this is the many disputes that have come across about Twitter and the problems that many people have had being harassed in their Twitter accounts. And it, I get frustrated about this because Twitter puts an enormous amount of effort into trying to figure things out. They could put more effort into figuring out how to make it, uh, how to square that dif difference between a certain amount of freedom of speech, but also the freedom for people to not feel harassed within Twitter. And that balance has been areas where many organizations have not put enough effort into it. That's changing. I'm glad to see we're making a bit of an impact on there, um, but we still have a long way to go. And that, I think, is one of the two problems our profession has that we need to deal with. The other is over privacy. Um, we've seen in the last dozen years or so a huge growth in the power of a surveillance state, particularly in America, but not just in America. Um, and we have to push back against that. And a lot of it involves educating people about why these issues are important, using our knowledge of how software works to help um, spread information around, and to fight back against um, privacy, people who are trying to 
um, invade privacy. Um, and those are two things that matter a huge amount for me. Your choice of what matters for you may or may not be different. But again, what matters in the end is this thing about responsibility. We are all responsible for what we do, for what our software does, for what the profession around us does. When I originally gave this talk back in Germany a few years ago, I actually couldn't come up with a title for a long time. And so I was quite happy with leaving this one up for a bit. And then I realized that I finally came up with a title. Um, we aren't just people who sling around code. We can and we should take a bigger role in the societies that we work in. And that means, at the beginning, it's taking responsibility for what we do, and then beyond that to say, we have a responsibility to change and better the broader world. And on that note, I will leave you for good. Thank you.